welcome back. Um, have a seat. We are so excited to bring you the second panel of discussants. Um, I'm going to get out of the way in a second. I just want to introduce the moderator, who I'm sure you probably all know, but this is just to give you a lovely reminder. I'm Abra Johnson from Honey Pop Performance. Uh, we would love it if, um, if you have items that you want to bring to our archive down the stairs to the right. Um, this is also an archiving event where we are trying to create a digital uh, database, a map, an archive of this nightlife history in Chicago that will live on beyond all of us, we hope. Um, so please feel free to come and talk to us. Uh, we are doing interviews, we are scanning items, um, as well as uh, having a little bit of a DJ workshop later on, so if you want to stay for that, you can too. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Named the custodian of the indie soul movement by singer-songwriter Eric Roberson, Dwayne Powell has cemented himself as a leading artist in the Chicago music scene. Beyond his talent as a tastemaker, DJ, and producer, Dwayne has also been a promoter since launching his Sound Rotation brand in 1999. Follow Dwayne E. Powell on Instagram and at Sound Rotation on Facebook. We are so happy to have you here as always, Dwayne. Welcome, panelists. Woo! Testing. How everybody doing? Um, still with us? Still with us? Still interested? <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm excited because we have some stellar people on this panel. And I don't know how often we get them all in the same room. That part. <laughs> I want to start my brother over here though, who was supposed to be on the first panel, but traffic and everything um, made him get here not on time, so he still has a lot to say. So, um, Gene Hunt is truly one of Chicago's pioneers in the house music industry since the early 80s. He has been one of the top jocks moving and educating crowds and music lovers for the past 25 years of his career. It's actually been way more than 25 years. Um, the legend has worked with some of the heaviest hitters in the game, such as Ron Hardy, Frankie Knuckles, Farting Jack Master Funk, and Kenny Dope of Masters at Work. You can learn more about Gene Hunt at www.mrgenehunt.com. I'm going to go in order. Control Zora is a Chicago DJ and collector co-founder dedicated to preserving the act of sonic communion and marginalized people through house, techno, and other rhythms throughout the world. They frequently co-curate musical and social city events alongside activism, work for the equity of reclaiming black-owned spaces within dance music as well. You can follow Zora on Instagram. Control Zora, the C T R L Z O R A. Um, who we have next? Oh, Joseph D. Alexander, also known as J Star, is an internationally accredited DJ, music and live music production producer, born in Chicago, Illinois. With music in his bloodline, Alexander has been professionally performing in the industry from the age of seven. His voice has been shared across stages such as um, the Obama, the music, Michelle Obama Kids Inauguration, ABC7 and WGN News, Ronald McDonald Charity Events, and more. While being a DJ, Alexander makes history at the, made his, marks history at the age of 21 as the youngest person to perform at the Chicago Chosen Few DJ Festival. He is one of the leading forces behind the preservation and acclimation of the Chicago house culture and sound amongst the millennial and Gen Z black and brown generations. Proclaimed as Chicago's youngest in charge, he has played alongside the likes of Mike Dunn, Terry Hunter, Jamie 326, Ron Carroll, Osamlade, Natasha Diggs, and Dion Cole, and is well on his way to becoming our next music icon. And I agree. Next, we have my girl, Carly Thornton, a.k.a. DJ KT, um, is a passionate devotee of house music deeply rooted in, in its rich history. She inherits her DJ legacy from her father, 
um, positioning, herself, positioning herself as the next generation in this musical journey. Raised in a family where her father's musical influence was prominent and her mother held a profound love for jazz, Carly's life was an intricate musical tapestry. Surrounded by club owners, dancers, and musicians, she grew up in a vibrant, a vibrant environmental akin to a musical theater. Although her DJ career is in its early stages, Carly's profound connection to music is undeniable. Her song selections resonate and with deep emotions and seamless grooves. As she ventures further into her DJ career, Carly eagerly looks ahead to the evolution of her craft, which each beat and melody added new chapters to her musical odyssey. And last but not least, we have DJ Double Eight. Multi-skilled artist DJ Double Eight has been DJing for 12 years. Really? Okay. <laughs> and also enjoys, that was no shade. Uh, for Double Eight, DJing is, an important, is important because it gives the people something they can feel and understanding of where Double Eight is coming from. Keep up with DJ Double Eight on Instagram at DJ Double Eight and also at SoundCloud at DJ Double Eight. Um, I'm gonna, I guess I'm gonna start with Jean um, because what I um, I did an article for the Chicago Reader um, last year about um, the Catholic school, the Catholic high schools contribution to house culture. A lot of my generation got our first um, taste of uh, parties and dance music culture, like Darlene was saying on the, on the panel before, and 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 gymnasiums and high schools and predominantly Catholic high schools. Um, and I thought of Jean when I, when I um, did an article because Jean was a resident DJ at several places and he was probably one of the youngest. Yeah, you were definitely like the youngest DJ on the scene. Um, I think you had residencies as young as 13 years old. Am I correct? Yes, sir. Are we there? Okay, there we go. So, um, you know, one of the things I was definitely wanted to speak about on this panel was about you know um, coming into uh, a culture at an early age, and um, I know for me, my experience was one of barriers in the sense of that I remember a lot of the older generation that was going to places that I was not to be able to get into, like you know the original warehouse and you know so many underground places, and I remember them viewing the places that we had access to at our age as like what is this rumper room, you know, kind of you know kind of thing. Um, did you, how did you even get past those barriers so young? Well, first of all, I mean, I was hanging out with an older group of people. So like the Rivieras are 21 and older club. So I'm in like my freshman year in high school, but I would pick Frankie up from the Charlie Club and he would come in from New York. And that would give me access to be able to go in some of the, like the more exclusive places. I started when I was like 13 years old. So by the time I graduated in eighth grade, my freshman year, I'm playing at the Bismarck, Medusa's, Sawyer's, Resurrection Hall. I'm doing all that stuff at that point in time. But I always hung out with like older individuals, like Lil Lewis, Bismarck, so forth. So it was kind of like I had brothers around me that would actually get me into establishments that I wasn't really old enough to be in at that point in time. So when I would hang out with Ron Hardy and Robert Williams and so forth, they would, uh, and get me in some of these venues. So that's why I had access to going to like some of the different places in the city. But getting into the venue is one thing, but actually you getting in, getting on as a DJ so young at that time was really unheard of. When I found out that he and I actually the same age, born the same year, I was floored. Um, <laughs> because this brother's name was on so many flyers and so many of major events with so many of the heavy hitters like you know, suggested in his and his bio that I thought he was one of their peers. You know, um, to find out like literally we were in the same year, I was like, wait, what? You know, um, because a lot of us, like I said, for us, you know, we did have this situation where a lot of the places back in our day were 18 and over to get in. Um, but even still, there was like these, these barriers of kind of keeping us away from these spaces. Um, and, and I was like, did Gene just move? How, like, how did he move so effortlessly to get on these tables and then become like headliner? You know, that was just interesting. You know? I mean, it was obviously timing. The timing was excellent, like in reference to that era, like in the 80s. It's like I started playing professionally in like 86. So 
Of course, my mom would always be like, okay, you going out to a party, uh, explain what you're doing. So I bring the flyer home and show her the flyer and whatnot, and she'd be like, okay. She was cool with it. She didn't like really refrain me for doing it. She knew how passionate I was about it. You know, my grandfather was a DJ, and my other grandfather played with well, I'm a, a, a Jamal, a jazz band. So I was, like, this, uh, this music influence since childhood. I got records of me turning my tricycle over and putting 45s on it. And Lord knows how many component sets my grandmother had got them torn up. Oh, wow. <laughs> that, is, that, is so, <laughs> that is eerie. That is that is actually eerie, yeah, crazy, so. because my story, that's wow. I, okay, I, okay. My mom tells a story that when I was three years old, I turned over a tricycle and put a 45 on the wheel. Yeah. I ain't know that happens to anybody else. It was <laughs> wow. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> um, actually, I just, well, with the rest of the panel, I, want, I just want to get into um, your beginnings. Um, because a lot of you, even though it seems like you're just beginning, you guys are like doing the damn thing. <laughs> um, um, just each one of you, just... Give me a, just a brief uh, synopsis of, of how you came into it. Or how you, what was your beginning? What was the moment that you decided that you wanted to, you know, press play or put the needle or whatever it was that you that you doing? Um. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I feel like my story kind of started very early. My dad was always like a house head. Um, he's fifty five, so he was around the same camp of going to different just warehouse and music box parties. He personally loved Medusas though. He has so many stories about Medusas. Um, he wasn't a DJ, but my uncles, they DJ'd. Um, and I just always was surrounded by house music as just like a president, like that was just like, I would consider house music to just be familial or just communal music to me. Um, it just was always there. Um, but the music that I just was always really infatuated with through my father was just jazz, um, global grooves, stuff like that. It just made me have an ear very young for just wanting to find more like obscure music or later on I realized as I started doing my research, it was like really aligned with like music that was just like the manifesto of what they were just playing at like the loft. Um, so I always was just into house music. Probably around high school is when I more so started like attending events or just getting more and more into it. Um, but it's actually interesting, like I never thought about DJing even though I was told that I should have DJed like a long time ago because I ran music blogs. I was always just infatuated with music, worked at record stores. Um, but it was actually, I was in college um, and I was supposed to be a psychology major. I was supposed to be a psychiatrist. Um, but, and I feel like DJs are psychiatrists anyways. You have to, yeah, you like, so I mean, I still, I still get that outlet through there in that way. But actually my sophomore year, I had to drop out of college because my mother had sadly passed away. Um, and I was at a very big crossroads in my life. Um, but one thing that always kept me through or made me feel understood or rooted was music. Um, and I feel like people, when you lose somebody so close and so pivotal to you in your life, you kind of get at the point where nothing but your own satisfaction matters or nothing but your own life purpose that you feel like you were made for matters because this is a very, you only live this life once. So. I just started to um, learn how to DJ finally. Um, and that's how I became Control Zora. I started curating events. Um, I started making collectives. I started immersing myself deeper and deeper into the house community more and more intergenerally, intergenerationally because I think that that's something that is extremely, extremely important because without the past, we would not have the present or the future. Um, and also, just in the city of Chicago, there's just extreme disparity um, in the music scene of, a, of genres that we created, which doesn't sit right with me. So it felt like I had a goal to accomplish. Um, 
and it's brought me to here now, which is lovely. Yeah. Um, I will say I am also a part of the My Dad Was a House Head Committee. Um, heavy on the basically growing up as a little kid, tuning in to like 106.3, heavily on the Friday night with Mike Dunn, Lil John, consecutively, like the same way uh, your dad had stories, my dad had stories about the VIP bar and grill, because uh, we were a group of suburbanite kids, I'm a suburbanite kid myself, um, but ultimately, as far as DJing is, is concerned, um, my dad just randomly bought an uh, application on his computer. Uh, basically, we, I'm, I'm a part of a major musical family. Music has always been in my bloodline, literally since uh, my mom going backwards. Uh, my aunt basically used to be a Motown exec, still is. Um, and so basically that kind of carried on down the lifeline of the bloodline. Um, but my dad basically just bought a random DJ application one day just to play around with and kind of see, okay, you know, kind of put some, blend some records together. I guess he wanted to be a DJ, but God told him no and told his son yes. Um, <laughs> but randomly one day just came across the program and just fell in love with it heavily to the point where it was almost like if I wasn't doing homework or basically in a position to where, you know, plan or whatever else, I was invested in that software. It got to the point where basically they started investing in me and basically growing my catalog and also the equipment um, until the point where basically my mom, who isn't a house head, was a skater. So what she would do is she would take us to uh, Glenwood Roller Rink for their gospel skate nights. And eventually, <laughs> I ended up basically f uh, finding my way into the DJ booth there and kind of uh, under uh, undergoing a process of basically becoming a skate DJ. Um, so that's kind of where I cut my teeth at, um, basically, you know, playing the gospel cuts and whatnot. Um, house music means a lot to me because I've always felt like a part of me has never really agreed with or felt connected to music that's attached to my generation, if that made sense. Um, and I say that because I guess that has a lot to do with my upbringing too. Um, people will say that I'm an old head. I finally agree with that because I guess it is what it is right now. Um, but I say that to say um, even while I was a skate DJ and even kind of, you know, doing the birthday parties and the school events, I just never really liked it. Um, it and it got to the point where people would ask for requests and, you know, play X, Y, and Z. And I'm like, I don't have that. Like, I don't listen to that. I don't know what you're talking about. You know, and also being a, in a, a religious household too, you know, I wasn't allowed to listen to a lot of that to begin with. So really house music was not just the only kind of release, but also just kind of what um, I gravitated to because that's what was played. You know, if mama wasn't playing gospel, dad was playing house music. That's just how it was in my household. Um, and so eventually, uh, basically starting my journey, uh, moving around, I actually had the opportunity to basically be a, a, a sound assistant aide at one of the Chosen Few festivals. Basically one of my uncles was an A2 or basically an audio assistant. Um, and so really got the chance to connect and actually meet some of the people who I listened to um, growing up. And then since then, God put his hand on it and literally the rest blew up to the point where I met um, basically a fundamental uh, person in the industry now. His name is Reg Reggie Corner. I met Reggie at a, at a guitar center at a random time, like nothing was, it wasn't a hey, you know, me, no. He was buying a speaker, I kid you not. He was buying a speaker, playing house music, and I was like, what is that, you know, can I connect with you? And the rest was history. Um, and so now I'm at a point in my career where literally the people who I was listening to with my father are now my mentors. And I think that's very special to me um, and very dear to me. Um, and so that's a, a long story, some short, <laughs> and I hope it made sense, but that's kind of my, my journey until now, so.
My story is also kind of similar to my colleagues as well as far as here, you know, my upbringings. Uh, my dad was a uh, percussionist and a producer. So I grew up a lot around going to his band practices and going to his concerts in St. Louis. That's where I'm from, St. Louis. And my mom was a big jazz head as well. So I grew up around a lot of music uh, and the black theater as well. So I always kind of had this joy and love for communal spaces where people can get together to find joy and excitement in music. And I always kind of wanted to replicate that throughout my life and everything that I do. And when I moved to Chicago about eight years ago, I came here for school, I went to DePaul. I started to be an event photographer and I started to just go out to a lot of different events. I was outside like six out of seven days of the week, just trying to explore Chicago, find my community, find myself as uh, someone in Chicago who didn't know anyone, didn't have any friends, didn't know much family here as well. And I found a lot of events like AMFM, Dwayne was DJing a lot as well, um, the dojo and just these DIY spaces that young people around my age that were creatives were just getting free and dancing to house music, dancing to soul music and just having community just like I grew up around as well. And I decided that I also wanted to help to curate these types of moments. And uh, about seven years ago, I started my own music event production company called Aura Sounds here in Chicago. And I was um, bringing together musicians I had met as an event photographer to be band directors and produce these jazz show intimate like concerts um, at a jazz club. And after I finished doing that, I started to travel and try to witness concerts and shows in Amsterdam and London and in New York. And I just got a chance to see how beautifully music can touch people around the world and how different clubs are doing it and how different DJs are doing it around the world as well. Um, and I got involved with Party Noir and I had uh, started being an event producer for them when I was 19. 19, 20 years old, so they were sneaking me into the promontory <laughs> through the back elevator. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and they also helped to introduce me to like a whole different world and just the Chicago scene. Ray Chardonnay really brought me in as well, um, kind of as a mentee and just a little sibling and started to introduce me to folks like Sean Alvarez and we would go out to more Dwayne Powell <laughs> parties as well. And I really found so much love in house music because it's really resembling of a lot of the music that I grew up around. Uh, my dad being very percussion heavy, I find house music uh, has a lot of those elements from timbales to bongos and kungas. And it just sounds like home to me. And it always has been a safe space for me to bring me joy in any type of moment. I also have ADHD, so I find myself getting like not focused a lot, and house music always helps to kind of tune me in and bring me back to my core and what I need to do and just focus. And as years have gone by, and I'm still an event producer with Party Noir, and I have my own um, skating brand called Fro Skate as well, when the pandemic hit, I didn't really know what to do because a lot of my passion was in creating space in person for people and a lot of that included uh, beautiful musical experiences as well. So I decided that I have all this music in me from what my parents showed me, what I picked up over the years and just my innate love for music and I somehow wanted the world to also just see that and hear that besides the playlist that I was making and little mixtapes I'd make for people as well. And I picked up DJing a little bit in the pandemic, you know, I would go live on Instagram. Um, and just over the years, I've just dabbled with DJing. Um, I never really thought that it would be a career path for me. It's just, I just love music so much. And I feel like I have so much music inside of me. And I want, I just love seeing people light up and come together and enjoying um, the selections that I have and that my friends have. And, that happens through DJing, and that's just what I've continued on doing for the past few years, is DJing. <laughs> that's how I found it. How's everybody feeling? So, I started out as a backup dancer for Shaka Khan, but somehow, you know, I found out that the DJ was, you know, controlling the music. I was like, that's where I wanna be. But see, the thing is, 
my dad's my dad was a DJ, you know what I'm saying? Word to him. So basically I would um we was we was living we was living in a house or whatever and we was uh we was in a basement and you know I would see his turntables and vinyl, I'd be like, Dad, what's this? He'd be like, This is what DJs do. So I was like, I I'ma just I'ma just watch you or whatever. But then later on I started um I was like, Dad, can you teach me how to DJ? So I was really I was really big on hip hop. I was really big on I was trying to I was like my first time first time practicing with my dad, I was trying to blend hip hop with house. Didn't work. But we'll see the thing well see <laughs> we'll see what had happened was is that basically I was very big on hip hop. I didn't want to play house. But my dad forced me to play house. So um yeah, and uh another thing is uh when I first started DJing, I started out with CDs. You know, I would take the um I would y'all know how to like burn the CDs, but um I started out with CDs at my church event. I didn't have my own equipment at the time. I was using my dad's stuff. Then some um somewhere later down the line, I get my first laptop and I sucked. I was I was slam I was slamming records back to back like I was from New York and stuff. You know, I was acting like I was Kid Capri or somebody. But um <laughs> But yeah. So meanest to say um, I started like, you know, going to like house events, you know, different varieties of music, you know what I'm saying? Different genres of music and get the understanding of it. So basically when I, um, when I started seeing these DJs using MacBooks, I'm like, I got to get me a MacBook. You know what I'm saying? That's the way I'm going to invest in my craft. But, you know, um, later on, later on down the line, I just, um, I just been practicing, you know, with the MacBook and getting better and better at it, you know? I was still slamming records back then, you know, but, um, what else, what else? Uh, I started, yeah, I started, I start, uh, well, when, while you were in that thought, so you say your father forced you to, to, he, to play house music, but you definitely love it. Cause we see you uh -huh. like, if anybody has ever seen Devin just on the dance floor at a party, he is just like, the energy bunny. <laughs> um, yes, sir. And uh, you clearly has like a, a, is, you clearly have a love for it now. Like it's, uh -huh. it's, it's it, it touches my soul every like every time when I hear house music, I just go I just go cuckoo for cocoa puffs. You we know? have to reel him in, like. Uh huh. But but Break see the thing is my my like when my dad forced me to like practice with house but see the thing is I was very I was very big on hip hop I ain't gonna lie I'm a, I'm a hip hop head but I wasn't a house head well this one I was like twelve I wasn't a house head then but as I got like the you know motivation the understanding and like the people that was playing house I got more I got more into it and you know and it's like a it's like a spiritual thing it's a body thing it's a soul thing. You know, house music is nothing to be played with, you know, so yeah. So with that, with that train of thought, um, like me and Gene both come from a generation where, you know, we knew this music before they would call it a house, right? I remember when they were calling us Preppy and it was Punk Out and it was, you know, all these other things. And there wasn't as many like um, walls around us when it came down to the music because house was really created from all these genres. It was literally like, there's this train of thought that house rose out of the ass of the disco demolition, which I dispute um, because house wasn't just directly, it was, house is just not a direct lineage of disco. It's disco funk, it's, 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 not even in the, it's not even in the four to the floor, it's in the groove, it's, it's, it's so much more into the pot. It's Italio, it's just all this stuff that we just kept adding to the pot, adding to the pot. And then like the 90s came along with rave laws and everything that kind of squandered a lot of the opportunities on the underground to the point where there was really wasn't much of an underground scene. Um, and w when hip hop came in, in as a as a lived culture in Chicago, they became like these divisions, right? Um, and you kind of speaking to that, like I was a house head, I was a hip hop head, mm -hmm. and whatever. Um, but then slowly, um, because you, I mean, so slowly, I'm watching DJs like you guys, you see yourselves with with J Star talking about certain music being attached to your to your um, generations. Um, 
do you find that you have, do any of you find that you have to kind of satisfy because you play for a lot of, of, you know, of, of, you know, for your generation, do you find that you have to kind of find ways to appease them? Or do you find ways, have you ever found ways to be able to incorporate that into your, into your flow? Or do you just say, hell no, nah, I ain't doing it? I'll say both. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the reason why I say that is because I think what kind of, well, put it to you like this, especially with my, with, with my background and how it's brought up, basically I am probably one of the few, you know, including, you know, a few of, of us who are on this panel that literally only play house music. Like, you will not catch me playing anything else. I do not play Steppers Cuts no more. I do not play the Cha-Cha Slide. I play, you know, I, I, I'm strictly house music. Um, but with that, though, um, I find myself now understanding kind of uh, the equivalent of what you're saying is that house really, there, there's, no, there's no fine definition of what house really is. Um, and when I say that, uh, basically, Reggie, we were in a conversation similar to this and he made a, a really profound point. He said, house really isn't a sound, it's a feeling. Um, like when, when you really think about it, house is literally every single genre that there is, but it's how, it's how you feel when that record is played. Um, and so what, what I found myself doing a lot of times is trying to find the, um, find the equivalent to basically um, music that is current, but still has that feeling to it or still has that message to it. And then I can put basically what um, the feeling in it <laughs> and, and, and then present it in a way that's palatable and then basically watch my peers gravitate even more to it. Um, and so for me, that's kind of been beneficial uh, and what I've been seeing kind of work in, in my area, in, in my field. But I, I feel like it's a it's a two way. It's a two way street. You know, not to say that you still get that one person like, hey, can you still play X, Y and Z? Like, nah, this ain't that night, boo boo. Play that in your car somewhere. Uh, but at the same time, though, it, it, I do think it is that balance between the two worlds. Gene, how, do, how, how much do you think? Um, because you were definitely a, a, a DJ, like I said, coming into the game at 13 years old that had the ultimate of the ultimates as mentors. Um, or do you feel that they were mentors or did anybody actually, um, you know, it, did anybody, did you feel like anybody mentored you? How, how important do you think mentorship is and then, and for us to begin to be that for uh, the next generation? What a different part about my era is that I had so much of a variety of mentorship in reference to by me being a youngster and I'm being with all these grown guys that have accomplished this years before I even set foot to even know what the sound was. You got to think that house music was birthed in say a little bit after the disco era was over, maybe early 80s or so forth. I got in like mid 80s. So I got an opportunity to be able to be around some of the guys that might have 10 or 15 years further than before I was created. So that ultimately gave me a guideline. It gave me something of a blueprint to create who I am, not trying to duplicate what they're doing, but having that inspiration and that influence was very essential for me to be able to take some of these objectives of what I learned during that time frame versus applying that now. I mean, so when I look at these different eras, you know, when I see the first wave of house people that came out in the first stages, it goes off into different equilibriums of time. You had your 90 DJs that came out, then you had another generation that came out after that, and it's 2023. So you can see a spectacle of growth that has matured versus, you know, we didn't have CD players. Like the CDJ was not invented. There was no internet. You can't go on track source and buy music. You have to get creative, and this is where you had to find out who you really were as far as having the access that they have. They have an access. They can go online and buy music. They can go here and get it. 
No, we had to go to the shops and we had to go find stuff. Sometimes I would have to bring a big reel to reel in the party. Hey man, I want to get in the party free. Pick the reel to reel up there. Come on, let's let me show you where to go yeah. put it at. Put the tape deck over there too while you're at it. You <laughs> Y'all definitely free, don't know you about carry that. Real. <laughs> being a, being the crate carrier, being one of the crate carriers. That was how you got in. So in order for us to be able to break music and for us to be able to play stuff, like I remember one time I was at the music box and me and Ron Hardy were playing. And Derek May and Kevin Saunderson would drive from Detroit to the Music Institute. That's where they had their party, where they were doing techno in Detroit. They would drive up to Chicago and bring us test pressings of the music for us to break some of those tracks, like Strings of Life and things of that nature. They would bring the vinyl up. Because a lot of stuff, like people don't get it. Some of the best music in the world is on vinyl. I don't care what you say. You can go on track source and do whatever you want to, but all the goodies are on vinyl. It's limited copies. If you get it, you get it. You don't, you don't. It's like now, I go downstairs in my basement. I'm shopping in my own stuff. I'm in my own store. I didn't remember buying this. I mean, I got records like everywhere. So I turn my CD burn on. I make me an MP3 of it or make a wave of it. I go to the party, Gene, what's that? They trying to Shazam it, no results. <laughs> because you ain't gonna get it, period. You don't even have access to that. So for me to go downstairs, I got my own store in my basement just for me, just being a junkie, just buying music and just getting it. So when this transition happened, in reference to the USBs and you know, the hard disk and things of that nature, we didn't have that access. It was a crater records, and you bring your little needles to the party and do your thing, unless you had a reel or a tape deck. It was the only way that you can break out new material. And we would get test presses of music back in that era where we can actually play vinyl. But the accessibility of what you guys have is so beautiful because you guys have access to be able to go do the research, go back into that time machine and get reference. So all the things that we did, you guys have a pathway or a gateway to take it and evolve it and take it to levels that can be way expendable. Chicago has some of the most talented people in the world. When it just comes down to sound, it's just us as a people in this city. We just have somewhat of a, it's like magic. We really produce wonderful individuals. I'm proud of each and every one of you guys, by the way, because it shows that there is a future and that it can continue to go on throughout the course of a starting period and it's still evolving today. Yeah. So I was, Thank you. yeah, clap to that for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so I was at a K. Trinata um, show at Concord Music Hall. I don't know if anybody's familiar with the producer K. Trinata. Um, amazing, in my, in my opinion. You know, there was a conversation that was had. I don't know if y'all heard of this artist that had this album out last year. Her name was like Beyonce or something like that. Um, and she had this album that all of the publications were talking about bringing house back and so on and so forth. And I got hit up by all these major publications, uh, Rolling Stone Magazine, um, OK Player, Vox, all these people like called, because it was right after I did that article. So I guess my name kind of came up about you know, whatever. So I got all these contacts asking my opinion about it. And of course, they didn't like what I had to say. Um, and not necessarily because I was putting down her record or anything of that nature, because I wasn't. Um, and not even from the standpoint of, of me being like soil up in the chest, like what you mean, bring a house back, a house ain't never went nowhere kind of thing. Because I get what they were trying to say in terms of talking about it, bringing it to a new generation and, 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 and bringing it back to the mansion, yada, yada. But my point was with K. Trinata was he had been already doing that because he's been kind of that for y'all generation. I was at this K. Trinata show and I was in what I called the chaperone section because it was 18 and over. And I'm up in the back because I needed a seat. It was a standing room place, but you could sit in the back. And I'm in this room and I'm watching all of these 18 to 21 year olds and I'm watching these young people and I'm watching like, look at these folks. They are, they are like style, flavor. And all of a sudden I was like transported back to, it looked like I was at Medusa's. You know what I'm saying? And I'm watching this new generation. So I'm like, so I brought out those to say like, you guys definitely seem to 
the one thing that I feel like my generation didn't figure out is because we were just having fun. You guys seem to have figured out the whole branding and aesthetic thing a lot quicker. Um, access, again, yeah, and just kind of like branding yourselves, you know what I'm saying? Whereas, you know, in my 50s, I'm just really coming to understand like, oh, that's a brand. Like you've been, you know what I mean? Um, what Gene was talking about with access and everything else, how have you found, how, how if any of you found a way to, in your branding, brand yourselves and then have your own kind of individu individuality when it's so much, um, with, you know, you can get caught up into the digital age of sounding like everybody else because you're playing the same records. Again, there's the Shazam factor where you're trying to Shazam the song that this DJ is playing to incorporate into your set. Um, but how, did you, how, how is it that you guys are finding a way to make these be your own kind of brand and where you stand out from the, the next person? Uh, or is that even important to you? Um, yeah, I'm glad that we started talking about access because I think, I think it is a really beautiful thing and it's something that I've been like very cognizant of like for a minute now, um, especially dealing with something like house music that is something that is decades preceding us. Um, and now we have pretty much everything to our disposal. But there's just so much content where it can just be overwhelming. And I, I definitely hit um, some of those climaxes. And I feel like the thing that just kept me consistent or rooted was just your own individuality. Like what made the DJs before you icons was themselves, like not them just mimicking and copying. You can't mimic and copy other people because that's part of like the tradition of it, right? But like you also don't just want to be like carbon copy number 47. So I mean, I, I do agree with Gene, like some of the best records that you can find are on wax and you can go on track source or whatever, but that's never gonna mimic you getting in a crate and you listening or you going to a listening station or you archiving for yourself or just creating your own sound for yourself. Um, and that's just something that like I've been trying to keep in mind. Like like you said, um, for the catering, um, when I have to play a lot of events for, for people my generation, like a lot of the music that I'm breaking, um, it's like I'm breaking it to them because they've never heard it before. When I did like my, my Hour 9 Collective, I was a resident DJ and I played pretty much nothing but house. And it would just be like, droves of people coming up to me my age or like older a little bit younger being like I have never heard this music before but this is so good like can you tell me more about it this is great like I always come to your sets because I know you're gonna play something new and different but it's still good and that's like that's what I feel like the purpose should be like not to play stuff that people already know or even like you guys already know like if you guys want to go listen to some classics, you would go to like the classics, the solidified players. Like I feel like I should leave that to them, but like I should also have the integrity of the genre by digging and learning and exploring and like having those sounds and putting it out in my own way so I can do that in a way that's fresh but still like respective of the integrity of the genre. I kind of want to also slightly touch on that as well. In the branding aspect, there are a lot of DJs that are out there that say that they're house DJs, and I think we're pretty well traveled as well, and we've seen a lot of incredible, or just a lot of people that are house DJs around the world. And a lot of what we hear and what we see from our generation are techno house, um, <laughs> dance house, but we don't hear a lot of house music that is kind of rooted in the history and the culture of the birth of house music. The soulfulness of house music, I feel like, is missing a lot in what we're hearing from our colleagues, our generations of other house DJs. So I feel like for us, it, we don't really even have to try to brand ourselves differently too hard because what we're doing is paying homage to the roots of house music and introducing our generations into what that is. I DJ Party Noir a lot and the party noir crowd loves some booty shaking, you know, <laughs> hip hop, ratchet stuff. And when I play Pound house Town. music, they're like, 
this isn't Gypsy Woman. Like, <laughs> what is this? You're playing Timmy Regisford? Like, who is that? You know? And it's definitely, we know it's our duty to introduce them into the roots and also not just older music, but new music that's coming out that is reminiscent of the soul of what house music is. Like, so I think for when it comes to branding, I think we just kind of naturally are able to separate ourselves a little bit and also still kind of cater to what they want to hear as well. For instance, you did a mix recently that was Black Motion and Kendrick Lamar. And I was like, that is very new, and this crowd don't even know what they're hearing because you're mixing some classic house with new hip hop as well. So I really appreciate when we're able to be able to speak to both crowds of everyone. But. Wait, can you repeat the uh, question one more time? Well, it was, well, it was just open. It was uh -huh. open-ended. If you, um, oh, so basically, the way I look at it, you know, some people, like when I come out to play, people expect me to play the same songs that other DJs play. But see, my thing of it is I I dig deep and I find, you know, things. Basically, I want to play something that they haven't even heard. You know what I'm saying? Some, basically, that, that I have them jumping off the wall, you know? Basically, what I'm basically saying is, like, I don't want to feel like, you know, I'm copying that same DJ that, you know, played. I don't know how many songs they play, but... Yeah, mm. you know, stuff like that. And I feel like, you know, house, like, I feel like, you know, they expect you to play the same songs. But see, the thing is, why can't we, why can't we, like, uh, why can't we listen to something totally different? You know what I'm saying? Different, different parts of house. You know what I'm saying? I understand, you know what I'm saying? Y'all want to, y'all want to hit a classic. Y'all want to go back to the warehouse days. But you need to, we need some new flavor. <laughs> Basically, I mean, you guys you are bringing, have, have, you know, there's a lot of new flavor, and you guys are definitely, you know, uh, doing that. But what, have, with that being said, uh, have you, what have been some of the challenges you, you have you faced in the situation of um, dealing with, you know, the old um, underground, you know, scene or um, dealing with my generation and older? Because there, you know, we definitely, you know, we've seen our fair share of like quote unquote gatekeeping, quote unquote, um, you know, because I've often said Chicago has more DJs than we have trees. And everybody is like vying for a spot and everybody's kind of got this idea, like he was saying, um, you know, J2 was saying on the panel earlier, like n knowing someone who's 40 and 50 still talking about they waiting on somebody to put them on, right? And there's a lot of sniping when they see a new person come onto the scene. It's like, wait, where they come from? Um, I even had a situation where like my DJ story came later, even though I was on the scene back in the day, I didn't start DJing until a little later. And there was a lot of DJs that felt like I jumped the line. Um, that part. <laughs> so have you guys, so I wanna start with, I wanna start with Zora because I, I met Zora when I did Boiler Room. And we didn't actually meet or talk that day, but when I put up the clip of the session, Zora is like right behind me. And Zora got a lot of attention. And when we, when we, when we finally met, um, I remember having a conversation, because um, this is another thing about, you know, dealing with, you know, generation to generation, you know, Gen X and baby boomers have a hard time with how some things have progressed in terms of, um, you know, gender pronouns and, and, and just all of this other kind of respect things. Um, and it was the same situation with you because um, Zora identifies as non-binary, they, them. And, um, you know, I remember was having a conversation about those barriers of trying to find, a, trying to be respectful, but also trying to get your respect, if that will. So what have been some of the, the things that you think our generation needs to hear or what do we need to do more of to help, you know, to, you know, mentor y'all, but then actually um, step back and, and, and it actually mentor y'all, but then also have you, uh, us learn from you because we still learning ourselves. Yeah, I mean, I feel like there's, there's, mentorship does not work if it is not a mutual thing. And I feel like, I don't know, it's just like such a cyclical story and it's because 
I have talked to elder figures who are more closed-minded, and I ask them, I'm like, when you were growing up and you were playing your music, the, those before you thought it sounded like nothing, and this is everything now. And the generation before, it was the same story, and the generation before, it was the same story. Like, people were turning their nose up on jazz music, and that has, like, opened so many sonic barriers for us. And I feel like... Just themes like that I find ever present. Like I think DJing is like one of the best examples of Afrofuturism because it is you like taking the homage and the history of music before you and like alchemizing it into something different. And I feel like with every generation, it is something different and something new um, and innovative. And those before, if they are not open-minded, are not always going to understand. Um, and. I don't know, I've, I've, me as a queer, and me as a non-binary person, there has been a lot of elders who just don't really understand what that means, so they automatically view me or think of me a certain kind of way, um, or I feel like DJing is a very, um, it can be extremely misogynistic, it is a very male-dominated industry, even though women definitely are the backbone of house. They've been the backbone of a lot of black genres. Um, so when you're someone that like is representative of a lot of like oppressive demographics, even within the black community, you're gonna feel the brunt of that. Um, but I don't know, I just, I feel like I, it's a double empathy. Like I understand like how from older generations viewpoint they could be ignorant of certain kinds of things because I feel like non-binary wasn't really a word in the in like your guys' generations. I mean, I feel like the whole house culture in general though was su supposed to be liberative and accepting, like come as you are. Like the whole point of house music, this was a queer thing and then like straight people got into it and like m men got into it and now house music is something that can be like extremely masculine but that's not how it started so I feel like especially in dealing with a wheelhouse like this like we should all be just extremely accepting and understanding because we're all coming together at the end of the day um like under the same sonic understanding, like not everybody understands house music. So if we're having that basis understanding, I feel like that should open up to understanding for a lot of other avenues. And I feel like that's historically what house music has done and what it should, should continue to do. When, when Dwayne approached me and asked me my pronouns, like I've been so desensitized at this point, like working with older people where I don't even really let it bother me anymore. Or I just don't even go there. I'm like, I, am I gonna get on this turntable, yes or no? Like, I don't wanna deal with you asking me if I'm a man or like, clearly I'm not like, I don't wanna go there. Like, but, but Dwayne was respective enough to like ask me and that was something that made me extremely like safe and comforted by him. And I just wanted to say thank you for that, but yeah. But, but okay, um, but still challenges wise. Um, I remember doing a party recently um, when format um, and I had to remember, I was like, my generation, it, well, the house, the music don't stop. Um, you know, you went from the turntables to the decks, but you knew what you were bringing. Now I've been to events where it's like, everybody's bringing their separate controller, everybody's bringing their separate this, then the other, um, with no continuity. Um, actually looking at it as if, you know, um, you gotta strike the set. Like, say, like, imagine going to a concert and there's an open, like, opening act. So you, you're DJing and then the music stops because they gotta hook up the next DJ kind of thing. Um, and that's a no-no. <laughs> that's a no-no because house is all about nonstop, nonstop. Um, Especially, so Carly, especially with Party Noir, because Party Noir can go to a multiple different things. Um, do you feel there's a need for your generation to, to be able to uh, streamline that more and, and format, or do you think there's like a disconnect um, in terms of understanding, um, what's the word I'm looking for? I'm, I'm, I'm stuck on a word, I just can't think of what it is. Um, 
well, from different, I guess of course from different genres, there there's always bred different styles of ways of DJing. Like Devin was talking about, you know, slamming, whereas in house you blend, um, and that has always been also dictated by the type of equipment that you guys use. Like first of all, I didn't even ask you what, like, what is your format? What 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 is your 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 go to? Do you are you on laptop controller? Well, I'm on I'm on everything. I play vinyl. I pl play thumb drive. I can play CD. Any anything, you know. So yeah. I don't think I've ever seen like a um, millennial or Gen Z vinyl set. Well, <laughs> you'll see you'll see it soon. Or on CD at okay. that point. <laughs> <laughs> I started out with CDs. Okay. But yeah, for sure. I remember I was DJing one time at Subterranean. This um this guy was about to perform and he pops out a CD and I'm like, dude, like, you know, well I wasn't well, I don't know, but <laughs> I, I was just I was just I was just shocked when he put out a CD. That's all. <laughs> um, <laughs> look. <laughs> Celeste is trying to help me not be digital bound, but I am digital bound. I am a controller laptop girl. Yes. Um, since I am newer to DJing, that was just, it was cheaper for me to invest in a beginner controller and start that way. A lot of my musical library, it's just easier for me to slide my MP3s onto Serato that I already have on my computer. And so I am currently digital bound but I would love to learn how to spin vinyl. I've been shopping a lot more and making sure that I have my collection ready for the day, <laughs> to be ready for the day that that comes, but yeah. Um, for me, I just want to start by saying this. I do like vinyl. I just don't like playing on it. Can we start off by saying this? <laughs> <laughs> The one, the, I, I, I hate. I like, feel like I'm cutting you off, but I, I'm, I'm feeling a sense of like shame. No, 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 um, no, 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 no. <laughs> and I've been, but I've been experiencing this too. I've been seeing these like wars and people, whatever, whatever. It's okay if you don't like vinyl. It's okay if you don't have vinyl. It's okay if you decide not to spend vinyl. So let's, but just, just put that there. And I, and I, and I appreciate that. Um, Com coming from uh, kind of a, a younger generation to the older generation mindset. Uh, but I said that mainly because um, for me, similar to uh, kind of my counterpart's situation, you know, kind of starting off in a controller setting. But honestly, I was forced to use CDJs, like especially because of who I was surrounded by and the position that I was in. It was either you going to play on CDJs or you not going to play at all. So literally my... my by CDJ, you mean the, you mean the 3,000 or 2,000 with the thumb drive? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So I, I literally had to figure out, you know, how to format record box and how to do all of that, mainly because that was the priority for my said field. You know, I wasn't about to bring a controller up to the Renaissance and expect to plug that thing in nor was there space for it <laughs> to begin with. So it's like, you know, being in that position, um, basically, I, I understand kind of both sides of it and being uh, more so obligated on the CDJ side now, it's kind of hard to go back to, to that surrounding or to those bases. But it's also one of the reasons why I feel like I really don't like vinyl. It's because of the fact that when that when that 1200 takes off, it takes off. When that CDJ, when you hit play, it don't move. I like that. <laughs> I like that, you, you know? Um, and for me, that's just kind of been my journey and kind of my cadence through it, but yeah. I didn't been in situations where I had one belt drive turntable with a nickel on it. And this one was a direct drive turntable with a nickel yes. on it, a realistic mixer or a Teledyne mixer and can play a four or five hour party in somebody's house with no problems whatsoever. It's not what you got, it's how you use yes. it. Point blank. Yeah. Whatever you got, I mean obviously, when you come to most of these nightclubs, they have what you consider as the industry standard, a Pioneer or a Rotary mixer. 
It's just like playing on like a regular new mark or whatever mixer that you could afford to have. But you turn it into the best situation that you can make it at because this is what you can economically afford. I mean, obviously, I love rotary. So Frankie gave me the power plant Bozak when I was 16 years old. I still have it in my house. It don't leave. But I got another mixer. I don't even use it. I use my other Omnitronic. Then I got a rain sitting on the floor with dust on it. And got faders and shit. So I like to change up my components every now and then, but I love playing vinyl. Just a couple of weeks ago, I did a vinyl set where I had two CDJs, and I had two turntables, and I had a Bozak mixer rotary. It was fun being able to transist on all four of those units and entertain the audience. The sound of the vinyl, the fidelity of how it sounded with that needle pressing against it. And I can be able to play something off of my thumb drive or what have you. But be able to be diverse in all areas to enjoy a two and three hour set of what I was playing. But I've also been put in situations where I just did a party and the guy had Serato Pro. So, wow, am I deer in headlights or am I going to man up? So I put, a, put it in there, loaded the crate in, and now I'm doing survival. Yeah. So now I'm sitting in this screen like the Twilight Zone. Oh, my God. But, but I'm doing what I have to do to get the job done. Yeah, that, that happened so, to me at a gig in Detroit. Like, they did not have you gotta, my you, you gotta do. They did not have my setup, and I ended up having to use this other DJ's laptop. And on the spot, right there, I'm the headliner. <laughs> You know, yeah, yeah. you got to get tough. <laughs> um, but with that, I will also say that, you know, yes, when life gives you lemons, you make lemonade. Um, but also, if I can offer any advice, is be more, definitely be diligent in the beginning. If someone's booking you about equipment needs, don't be afraid to ask for what it is that you want. Don't be afraid to have a, have a tech writer and being a little more demanding. You know, um, I've gone to places that I actually thought it was okay that I didn't have a monitor. Like, how am I supposed to hear? You know, like, definitely don't be, don't feel like because you're coming up in the game that you just want to kind of compromise certain things, to, you know, to be involved. Because once you, like, once... What I've learned in my thing is, you know, even when, it, when it's come down to people booking me and me trying to tell them my fee and things of that nature, like w once you kind of give them a quote unquote hookup, that's when they want to keep you throughout. So don't be afraid to be like, yo, this is what I need. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Be realistic about your needs, but then stand on them once you know this is the things that you need to make your, because ultimately no DJ approaches the decks whatever it is no no whatever his format is no dj approaches it the same no dj space is the same there's certain things you need some people you know um like you brought up celeste i know celeste if she has to bring her fan with her you know what i'm saying and certain things you know um i recently discovered that those absorbent mats those uh, mats help me um yeah you know and things of that nature um <laughs> When you get up in front of those decks, it's your space, it's yeah. your time, yeah. and you control that space and you get to ask for what it is you need to make that space comfortable for you. So that's just some advice. One thing I, I wanted to add too, uh, kind of to what Gene's point was um, about equipment wise and really about basically the, kind, not, not the gap, but for me, I also, I love rotary mixes. Like, especially when you get down to, like he said, the Bozaks, the uh, KRSs, it's is the warmth of it, you know? And I, right, the right. The isolation and, too. And so, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. It's more or not visual. Right. You see a waveform on the screen, you can actually see what's going on. When you got a V, you need a B. <laughs> <laughs> It's different. Getting a chance to have that remote feel as mm -hmm. not being a substitute for something that's realistic and non-realistic. There's a mm -hmm. difference. You can feel it more. Right, mm -hmm. right. And even, I mean, even to that, it kind of gives a new dynamic to current music, too, um, especially with how you play it. Like, I grew up watching Gene tear holes through systems, <laughs> whipping yeah. isolators. Some folks be afraid to book Gene because they're like, he gonna blow those. <laughs> <laughs> he gonna blow you know, the speakers. And like, like you know, he hearing that and f 
following DJs like Mike Dunn, Terry Hunter, Dwayne Powell, seeing that, seeing what an isolator does to a sound, you yeah. know, and how, how it actually curates a different experience and also how it actually gives you individuality mm -hmm. behind it is what I can appreciate and also what I think kind of helps merge that gap difference between kind of like, okay, how can you stay current but still have that warm feeling behind it? So, so that is why, because J Star, if you guys don't know, um, J Star definitely is the first um, uh, of the younger generation that I've seen the older generation um, approve and actually show up and want to hear him play. Like, you know, we're a tough crowd. Like, literally, you know, I've been, you know, m myself included, there's people who, like, what time you get on? We don't want to hit them other people, <laughs> you know? Um, and how do, you know, just, just from, you know, how does it feel for you just to be even have that, that level of trust that you be able to, like, Mike Dunn out on the road, um, his party is like one of the most popular parties on Sundays at Renaissance, and, you know, J, uh, J Star, you know, is on deck in his absence. You know what I mean? I, I, I'll say this because I definitely don't take it lightly, um, especially being in the position that I'm in. Um, and having that, I don't want to call it a weight because it's not a weight, it's more so a responsibility um, that I've been kind of given and respected and kind of trained and groomed by, you know, these people, you know, two of them sitting at the table to actually be able to execute that. Um, what I will say, though, is it's kind of been an interesting um, section or interesting part of life, finding your own sound. Um, and what I mean by that is because a lot of times, even though I enjoy the respect of the older generation, there is a certain sound that you got to hit in order to get them on the dance floor. And a lot of times that's consistent on a night by night by night by night by night basis. Um, and so really what I've been trying to figure out is, okay, how do I find my own individuality and my own sound behind so many huge giants. You get what I'm saying? Because a lot of times, and I, and I don't mind it, I, I love it, you know, people come up, yeah, you know, you sound like Mike Dunn, you sound like Jamie 326, you sound like Gene Hunt. I love that because these are the people who I've studied and actually followed. But it kind of got to the point where, and even Mike uh, kind of helped me through that, it's like, okay, the world doesn't need another X, Y, and Z. They need another you. Um, and so it's been an interesting season to try and find really what that looks like and really how that sounds, but then also try and cater um, and basically still hold up that responsibility in the absence of basically these giants. So it's, it's been a real interesting journey. Um, do, we, uh, do we have, we don't have Arca, do we? Okay. Um, yeah, let's get into these uh, submissions of archives here. Double eight. That was at 31st Street Beach. Period. Was that the, because you played at 31st Street Beach a couple times, right? Three times. Three? Was this the day that it was like all? My <laughs> but yeah, this was like the, uh, this was like the season finale. Basically, this was the last one for the night. So it and I think it was, a, I think it was, a, a, it was, a, was it, this, that's the night that you did the all millennial Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, okay. Yeah. What else we got? Jay. Your photo shoot was off the chain, by the way, sir. something 
That's your production? Um, yes, sir. I didn't get Thank an you. email, sir. It's, see, it's, it's coming. It's the Dropbox sync. It's coming. It's coming. <laughs> <laughs> but it ain't a wax. <laughs> Is that Robert? Yeah. Maybe it. That was at um, my first time playing the Silver Room block party, and Robert had came specifically to see my set, and I was very, very ecstatic. So I wanted to put that in um, for the archival. Yeah, um, <laughs> you took that photo, right? Yeah, Carly took that photo. Yeah, that's, that's bestie. You've yeah. had an amazing year. <laughs> like, Lil Lewis came back out of retirement and played, and Zora was on that bill. And I got a and story then, for that. And then, you know. That's you, out in the biopic. That's out in the biopic. You played, you played with us for the Frankie Knuckles tribute event. Like, I did, yeah. Yeah, she's been getting down. Yeah, I've been. Yeah, I've been. Yeah. Yeah. What is it? Oh, is that the post? Yeah, that was, um, oh, I guess maybe I was, weren't we supposed to submit like four photos or did I mistake that? I don't know. Did, well, you, were you we fine. supposed to submit multiple things or was I just being extra? You, you fine. You fine. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, that was the post. That was like the, I, th I thought that was cropped, but that was the, um, um, just like the deck and the mixers. Um, that was my first time playing on the Rotary. That was my first time playing for like an underground intergenerational club. And that pretty much was kind of how I like got like my feet wet for real in like the music that I wanted to play and how I wanted to play it and like the audience that I wanted to play it for. I had never played on a system like that and it made me yearn to continue really badly, yeah. Yeah, you were you were there that night when I was playing. You heard me play. Oh yeah, this was the Frankie <laughs> Knuckles thing. So this was the the, the Frankie Knuckles. Um, and oh, yeah, yeah, that was the Frankie Knuckles um, annual celebration. That's Dwayne and Antonio and Celeste. Um, so bless Antonio. We wanted him to be on this panel too, but he is in L.A. right now. Period. Um, because he is another of the new generation and is killing it. Like, he is, like, really, really killing it right now. So I want to shout out to Bless Sonio because he just got back in the country. Yeah, he just got through playing, like, Ibiza and and all these other places. He's in L.A. right now. Um, yeah, was that it? Okay. Um, so at this point, I think we want to just open up the floor to see if there's anything that anybody want to want to add to the conversation or ask anybody up here. Quiet. Yes, ma'am. You said you started off with hip hop. How did you find which was which did you find easier to blend and work with since you grew up hip hop and you transitioned into house? Did you find it easier to blend the hip hop because that's where you originally? came from, or was House more passionate? Well, see, oh, my bad, my bad. What you were saying? Oh, so my, so, during that time, I figured, like, you know, hip-hop was my, you know, my big, my biggest thing that I could blend, but I was, I wasn't playing no other genre, but, like, you know, but hip-hop, but see, but when I transferred, when I was, got, when I got forced to play House by my dad, but, um, as I transitioned to house, I started like getting like the knowledge, the wisdom, the understanding of it, and the essence of it. You know, yeah. And every time, <laughs> and like every time I was working with my dad, he would pop me upside the head for slamming records. You know, <laughs> he said he said you need to blend that, you need to blend that. You know, but as I but as I got older, you know, I realized. I realize blends matter because I realize and I'm realize I'm in a city that that blends. Not I'm not in New York, you know. I don't slam records, but as I got older, I realized you know blends is the blends matter, you know. So, as and since we're talking about as since we're talking about blends, there's definitely there's going to be a workshop with Jody Presser and J Two over here about technique and blending. 
um, because that it really is a thing. I was listening to a DJ that was that was in town that everybody was that that was a uh, out of town DJ. That everybody was like, he getting down. I was like, now y'all know damn well if that was a local DJ. <laughs> Y'all be raking us over the coals about them, them, them jam, jam transitions. <laughs> but I will leave it alone. Um, I have gotten the opportunity, mainly because Dwayne, I absolutely love him, um, has, as, as a DJ, when you attend, like say you attend another event and you see how the current DJ is on, on, the, on the decks and the, the crowd response to that. When you go and do your own set, what parts of those things do you kind of, kind of keep in mind or are mindful about when you are creating that type of journey for people? Because um, I, I, music, music is a feeling. So I, I do have a hard time when you have to stop and switch over to another system because it, it basically, I have to start all over again. <laughs> <laughs> whatever, whatever I was in, I have to start all over again. So when you go and see other DJs that blend or use the, the controllers without the laptop, do you kind of keep that in mind as you are growing into your craft? Um, yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, that's always been something that I've been extremely aware of. I I always, in my DJ sets, I want to emulate or conjure up the feeling of catharsis that I get when I attend other people's sets. Like, like Dwayne or Jean's, like, the music will never stop unless something is extremely wrong. So I know, like, for the Frankie Knuckles, um, tribute um i was going after greg like i tried to keep that extremely extremely in the forefront of my mind like no matter what you play it better be seamless from that last track <laughs> so you can do what you gotta do like yeah um yeah that's always something that i keep in mind uh, an emphasis on the journey as well like the whole point of a DJ set, or at least the way it was taught to me from my mentors or just studying is that it has to be a true sonic journey for you to even reach that catharsis in the first place. If you started off the first track, it's, it's given four to the floor, slam, like you, like you can start that way, but you at least need to be able to keep, sustain it or raise from it or like have some certain dynamic to have the dancer or the appreciator like along for that ride. So that's just something as I've been attending a lot of events and like really dissecting what has made me reach that spiritual catharsis like for me to emulate myself. So have, have any of you had that, you know, cause one thing that I do love is a high for me as a DJ is that conversation between me and the dancer. It's not my, it's not all my show is their show too. Um, and, this, and there's this give and take and this dialogue and this energy. So, um, you know, for me, like, I, I remember come, I was on a bill one time with a DJ who had the energy up here, right? Killing it. And I'm kind of sweating bullets because I'm like, oh, God, I got to, like, you know, because also if, I, if, if it's already up here, then how do I journey? You know what I mean? How do I tell my story when I'm getting on after this? So there's sometimes that does need to be a reset of the room. Um, because the one thing, like I remember partying back in the day, I remember the first time my introduction to the underground was the music box. And it was scary <laughs> when I first encountered it because first of all, it was dark. There was no windows and it was just pandemonium. Um, and I didn't know that the, the light, that the sun had came up on the other side of the door. Um, because there was so many resets throughout the night that you start all over again. Like after so many hours or whatever, whatever, there's like, you know what I mean? And so don't be afraid of those resets. Cause at some point as a dancer, and come on now, we in our fifties and whatever, we definitely- <laughs> You gotta take a breather oh, no, somewhere in there. We you definitely need to watch your break somewhere in there. We definitely need to, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> right. We need some electrolytes. We need some, some you know, all that. Fan, all that. A deep breath. <laughs> <laughs> because <laughs> there's times, there's times, yes. especially if you're doing like a three and four hour sets, there's times that I've DJ and afterwards I am wiped. Yeah. Um, energy wise. 
You know what I mean? Because you kind of giving you all, but definitely just that I that that dynamic of like I don't know if you guys you know have that in mind when you're thinking about it. Like, have you ha had that feeling of you having a conversation with the dancer? So um, I, I, I'm gonna try and say this without exposing myself, but. Uh, I have a soft spot for dancers. I love dancers of all, basically of all calibers. And all. my sister is a dancer, like it's, it's terms of rhythm and everything like that. Um, for me, how I've been taught uh, in this game is the dancer decide what comes next. Like in, in terms of energy and exchange, basically y'all decide. Like people ask, you know, hey Jay, you know what you playing? No. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, how I was taught was you have your, 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 your crate box <laughs> now of like 200 songs and literally depending on what's coming on after you or what's coming on before you, you let the dancer decide. But one thing that I'll also uh, kind of expound on to, to your point too is being a young DJ and having that DJ that's on 10 and me just wanting to come right in and just start beating mugs off the head, just wabba, wabba, and just stay there. But it got to the point where, you know, even like, you know, you, Gene, and a few others, it's like, okay, you don't have to beat people over the head every single time you play, Jay. You don't gotta come in swinging. You can take your time and build basically a story, yes. which is why a lot of DJs in our caliber cannot play longer than an hour. And it's the, it, it's the truth because of the fact that either we start off too strong and end up basically somewhere, man. And you um, run out of gas because you, <laughs> so, yeah. you run out of gas so, because so to Mentally that point, in your mind, to that point, I actually want to leave it on this. I want to ask you guys a question. So your motivation, because a lot of times I've had people ask me, you know, come to me about DJing and whatever else and whatever else. And I always want to ask this because there's different styles of DJing and there's different reasons why people DJ. Um, what is your motivation? Are you trying to be that DJ? that's on everybody's tongue? Are you trying to tell a story? Are you trying to be um, a star? Like, what is your motivation? Mine is to play good music. I want the crowd to feel how I feel when I'm listening to house music. I want the crowd to feel safe, to feel happy, to feel joy, to feel togetherness. Um, and I want them to vibe, just to vibe really hard. <laughs> And I, I don't want to get off topic either, but I did want to share something. I didn't submit an artifact, but I did write um, something after one of your Sunday service um, sessions that I would like to read, if y'all don't mind. It's kind of bringing us back to the topic of the dancer and the DJ. So I wrote, the relationship between the DJ and the dancer is one to not be taken lightly. The raise of hands, a reflection of Reiki, sending energetic, positive, affirming energy to the one who controls the crowd. The stomping of the feet sends shock waves back into the earth, adding to the baseline of the bump, hit, boom of the beat. The way the DJ can control my body in this moment is spiritual, is godlike, is closest to heaven on earth we get. To succumb to the need for involuntary movement drawn through your root from the belly of the speakers if you let it. I, the dancer, send back a cycle of energy, making this transfer a full rotation. Our joy is connected, our souls connected. I feel it, I let it, I let you take me. Surrender and let the DJ feel you. And that's what I want everyone to wow. feel. <laughs> uh, oh, my motivation is, you know, cater to the crowd. Um, Basic, well, this is what I go based off of. So, like, basically, say if me and J Star was playing, and I was gonna go on after him. So basically, I'm following the inner. Basically, I'm following the energy that he provided, and you know stuff like that. And um, just um, just built my crates up. That's all. You know, cater to the crowd. Just, yeah. Why do I DJ? I mean, I love it. I enjoy it. You know what I'm saying? It's my, it's my hobby, you know? I mean, yeah. <laughs> um, for me, 
it's been more so of a release um, personally, especially kind of with uh, basically a lot of things that I've, my journey through adulthood, <laughs> rather paying these grown ass man bills, um, amongst uh, other things, it's really been a release. Um, and this so- This fool been, <laughs> hey. <laughs> <laughs> welcome, welcome to the world. <laughs> I can't even say nothing because we definitely, uh, I, I never forget my first time moving into my apartment at 25. I was Man. like, wait a minute. Man, yeah. like, I re- like, why am I paying for a house? And she's like, ain't nobody finna come. Anyways. <laughs> but uh, basically, it, it, especially being in that, in that position, um, it's, it's, it's been more realistic than ever because it's the only chance that I get to actually release that, um, especially um, being with everything that's been going on, no matter what it is, for me, it's just been that release. Um, and really, really, so this has always been beat over the head by basically some of everybody that I've been mentored by. It's been music over the DJ. Um, and so basically saying that it's not about you. Um, it's not about what you bring to the table or who you are. It's about the music and the way that it makes the people feel. Um, and so that's kind of been my approach. That's been my motivation and how I've been able to actually release through it because I know it's about the music and not about me. So. <laughs> um, yeah, I remember I, I DJed um, for a dance studio, open dance studio, uh, a week ago, and they said, bring a word of intention for your set. And I said the same thing, my word was release. Um, yeah, definitely a motivation for me is just to hold spaces that can hold that release for other people. I know that the places like the loft and the warehouse and the music box, like the whole purpose of the people atten- like attending these events is because they had things that they had to release out, like other things in the world that had given them trauma or pain or even just excess energy instead of going to other vices that could be extremely counterproductive to the soul, they went to something that could be extremely nourishing for the soul. And I know that house music, as I've, shared I've gone through like adversities in my life that was always something that I could physically trauma is stored in the body so when you dance and when you stomp when you throw your hands out you are releasing that and that is something that I think is gold especially for us as a black people us as a marginalized people we go through so much trauma that we don't even deserve like we have to have space to facilitate that And I feel like more and more it is dwindling in Chicago. More and more it is not ministered by people that look like us. And I've seldom see it, um, especially coming from the hands of black femmes. Like, and that needs to be something that other little girls or just people in general need to see. We are extremely diverse and beautiful and um, talented people. Um, So yeah, there's many reasons why I DJ. I DJ because it saved my life, literally. And I would love to, give thanks and give ancestral worship through those who were before me, like through house music. I think house music is a very dynamic and spiritual and beautiful medium. Well, where are we on time? Uh, I should ask y'all, uh, if y'all can recall the moment when you were DJing, you had the synergy with the crowd where you feel like you had a ride. Like you had the moment where you were playing, they reacted to what you were playing, and you were like, yeah, this is it, this is what I do, you know? You can recall it. Can you answer that, Jane? What was the moment where you feel like you arrived? <laughs> I had that moment last night. And I'm gonna have it again tonight. You know, when you get into a certain space in your spirit and you see a room and you can read the room, it's like a musical aphrodisiac. Man. And what I mean by that is, it's also another term of rhythmic calisthenics. Yeah. I'm not a DJ no more, I'm a sound architect. 
So when you play Mike, your Mike, box, Mike, Mike. you play your box. You don't take no prisoners. You don't worry about anything that's around you. You in this cubicle space of peace of mind and you play your music. Every time I come play a party, and I've been doing this since the 80s, I still got that same energy when I was 15 and I'm 52. I still feel that way. That's my challenges. Those are my vices to be able to still see if I can be current and be able to evolve and expand throughout a course of time and still have that consistency. Those are like some of my greatest moments and then there's some of my most feared moments when I have to challenge myself as it be like, okay, you just did two parties last night. You just did two parties Thursday. You just did one Wednesday. You gotta do three tonight and you gotta do one tomorrow. Do you think you can still handle that stability and that mentality to get through so Monday, you won't be looking like, I'm gonna be like this. <laughs> but I'm gonna also be like this. Because I was able to test myself to see the boundaries of my talent and my expectations of who I can possibly be. It's beautiful, I'm looking forward to Monday. Because that's my week off. I'm turning Man, him listen. off. I'm turning him off. Listen. <laughs> off. That Shut moment, that Monday, who? That's that reset. I love it. Man. I love it. It's me and Netflix and my remote control and just being <laughs> all day. And turning it off. And turning it off. So I can build that momentum up again to get ready for my next task or my next journey. So when you have those moments, you save it. It's like me putting magic in a bottle. So when it's time for me to get to my next show, I still got enough gas in my tank for me to be able to keep the consistency. So thing, that's how you do that. One thing that's always been interesting is how y'all get drained from details, but then y'all get the energy from the crowd. It wears you out. Because you're distributing you so much. You're putting out energy. Yeah, because you're distributing. You're administering an intake or an outtake because you're giving so much of yourself. Yeah and your ability, but then it's being reciprocated, it's being recycled within yourself. But to be able to be very continuous with it and do it in one spot, I got 40 minutes to get here. <laughs> 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 so we can't be worried about what's going on. No, we don't care who that is and what the business because one thing that you have, ain't nobody has. Everybody has access. You don't go to a musical Walmart. So no. that means that you have something that's going to be unique. So you're not worried about who's playing after you, right. who's playing before you. You know that this is a job and a duty that you signed up to do. So you have to put all your expectations forth that by always being unique. If I shopped in the same place that he shopped at, that he shopped at, that he shopped at, that he shopped at, I be biting my nails. <laughs> because I got stuff that I know that don't nobody have. And I have a mind to be creative within that time period for me to get my job done, whether it's a two hour set, three hour set, or whatever. I know what I have to do. I can't think about all the other, like the uh, uh, distractions. Yeah. I have to be able to diversify myself. I'm still warmed up for my other two parties I got to do. So when I get to this one, I'm nice and warmed up. Only thing I do, I already season me. I ain't <laughs> <laughs> and get that bag and I'm out of there. Get and, then I can, and then when I get home, I can reset and restore my spirit and get ready and get prepared for the next task that I have. So that's how I do it. We can be yourself is important. We can be all day. Yeah, I had comments too. <laughs> I just want to say, personally, I've been someone who's been partying since 13. Look out, Medusas. Um, and have been privileged enough to walk into the Bismarck on Halloween night with Lil Lewis standing there dressed in all white doing one of these. Which is the truth, you know. I just want to thank everyone on the panel for dedicating your life to being curators of music. For me, you're beyond just a DJ. You're preserving and continuing to do that for the future generations. So thank you for that. I also want to thank you for all of your energy. There's a performance aspect to this that Gene was kind of just touching on and that Dwayne does every time where it's a dance between the DJ and the crowd. So I want to thank you all for your energy and giving that love of music to us as we can give it back to you as we dance.
musical architect of it, but you're also facilitators of uh, joint therapy. Yeah. Um, and so for a lot of people, and for me to be able to be in spaces with you all and, and, and experience that from different levels, um, I'm very grateful. So continue to uh, be prosperous. Thank you so much. So yeah, we could be all day because it's so much energy. One thing, uh, and this is more so for you than anybody else. Um, I don't know if you remember this, but Dwayne Powell was actually the first live DJ that I have ever seen play house music. Uh, yes. Basically, uh, my mom is, uh, she owns a publishing house and a lady of a mutual friend called Asada does a book fair. Uh, upon which Dwayne Powell has been baking the box consistently. Um, and literally, the first time that I actually got to experience an actual house music set in an outdoor setting was a Dwayne Powell set. Didn't know that. <laughs> Absolutely. So I just wanted to take the time and give you your flowers. I know that I've talked a lot about different DJs like Gene and basically different people who have helped me and molded me. but. Honestly, to be sitting at this table with kind of the first, it's a, it's a special and genuine oh, wow. moment, so I appreciate that. <laughs> so again, um, but thank y'all. Thank y'all for sticking around. Again, we're going to have a workshop with Jody and with J, um, J2 on the art of DJN. We have the archive station. We would love to hear your stories. If you got a minute to go into the next room to, if you want to just tell them a story about a, a party you went to or some memories we wanted to get, actually get that to archive, um, please share your stories because that is what this is all about, um, is the world knowing that these things existed, that black social culture in Chicago has been vibrant and is still vibrant and it's going to continue to be vibrant. So we definitely want your stories. We want your stories. We want your stories. So please share them with us, okay?